the program uh, this afternoon session. Attention to all the guests, please scan QR codes before going out to get e-certification scan at the exit door. Assalamualaikum to all honorable speakers and distinguished guests. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Shalom Si, scientist at the Halan Science Center, Juranongkorn University. I will be the MC for afternoon session. On behalf of HACCP committees, I would like to attend my warm welcome to all of you this 10th Halan Science Industry and Business International Conference, or HACCP 2017. We are about to start the technical session five. The theme of, of the session is methodology in Halan Science and accreditation. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Nasima Hamish uh, our moderator of this session. Welcome, please welcome. <laughs> Professor Dr. Nasima Hermes, he is head of food science and microbiology at Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Area of appetite, food science and biotechnology. Thank you. Thank you so much to the wonderful organizing com committee of HACCP. Um, welcome to this session and uh, we've got um, a couple of uh, interesting talks for you and um, we have a mixture of technical talks and um, accreditation talks as well two accreditation talks two analytical talks and um, the first one will be on uh, research and innovation for halal food sustainability and then we have uh, analytical talks on detection of halal, non-halal uh, compounds in, in food. And we have a, a Thai, yeah? uh, I I'm not sure if she's a student, Sunaini. She'll be talking about the use of sequencing techniques to identify haram species. On the accreditation side of the talk, we, we have um, uh, a, a representative, an expert from CIMIC, who will be talking about the role of CIMIC in establishing different method, standard methods uh, for halal detection in foods. And uh, we also have a representative from Thai, uh, talking about the accreditation as well. And uh, he will be talking about the national quality infrastructure. Uh, how it's used to support testing and certification of halal products. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first presenter, who is the chief, who is Akanong Jangboa. Dr. Akanong Jangboa is chief. It, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, food in our place first. Yes. So, a bit of a technical glitch here. No. All right. Um, you don't have it. No. Uh, you. Oh, maybe in the meantime, would the speakers like to take their seats, please? So we have five exciting talks from five distinguished speakers. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Yeah, so I just talk about her. Okay. All right, we, we can't get the slide up for Dr. Akanong. My, my apologies. Okay, there's been a bit of technical glitch, but um, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker of today, 
she, uh, Dr. Akanong is Assistant Secretary General for the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Office and also Chief Strategy Officer for Food Inopolis. So do you know what Inopolis is? Anyone here knows what it is? Well, it was quite interesting. I just asked Dr. Akanong and um, police is city in Latin. Inno is innovation, so innovation, innovation city. So please give a round of applause to Dr. Akanong who will present our first speech for today. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. So uh, my presentation would be um, on the topic of Food Inopolis, Resource and Innovation for Halal Food Sustainability. Um, well, as um, uh, been introduced that Inopolis is um, innovation and a city. So Food Inopolis is, a, in, in a nutshell, I would say is um, a specialized um, innovation place that focuses on food innovation. Um, I'll walk you through what it is and what we are doing uh, and how we can uh, support um, halal food uh, industry in Thailand. So a bit of uh, Thai economies, um, if we look at the, our GDP in uh, 2016, um, the figure is about uh, 400 uh, US billion dollars where, um, well I would say half of that is uh, from service sectors. Agriculture account for only 15%. And um, looking at, uh, in terms of uh, how we spend uh, in R&D, According to um, GDP uh, figures, um, R&D in food sectors, which is actually um, at the top rank, which is uh, account for 365, roughly 365 billion US dollars. Uh, this is the number of 2015. And um, look at the export food market, where we export our food market uh, at the most is uh, in ASEAN country, which is um, 60%. And um, about the figure of um, ease of doing business in Thailand, this is the figures, uh, latest figure that came out that we are ranked in the 26th place amongst 900, uh, 190 economies. Um, and this is up from uh, 48th place last year, so it's quite um, impressive. And uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, the 10S curve for uh, the new economic growth engines of the country. And of course, food processing and agriculture and biotechnology is among one of the 10. And um, the government is also um, been uh, talking a lot about uh, we are developing Eastern Economic Corridor where we uh, we put all the Thailand's 4.0s and industrial policy in action over there. And this is a combine of the investment between public and private sectors. Uh, and um, you will see uh, progress and development of Eastern Economic Corridor and also EECI, which is Eastern Economic Corridor of Innovation, where we put innovation zone also in Eastern Economic Corridor. So that is about a uh, briefing of uh, Thai economies, food sectors, and uh, environment of uh, in, uh, doing business in Thailand um, at a glance. So I will uh, take you to what is uh, food innovation? What is Food Inopolis? So uh, Food Inopolis initiative, it came out last year, actually mid of last year in May. And uh, we want to have Thailand as a uh, food innovation hub of ASEAN. We have a lot of uh, competitive advantage of the country. Um, for example, so we have the great variety of raw materials. We also a strategic hub um, in ASEAN country. And also we have excellent resource and um, in terms of uh, human resource and um, R&D uh, capabilities in human, uh, uh, also in food size and technologies. And we have been invest a lot in terms of uh, state of the art facility in university and research institutes. So this is one of the competitive advantages and what we already have to build up and to build upon um, food innovation in Thailand. So um, 
we have heard uh, of Food Valley. Food Valley is one of the uh, food innovation hub of the world. And if we look in Asia or ASEAN country, um, we have one kind which pretty much similar is called Food Police, similar to Food Innopolis, Food Police in Korea. But Food Police in Korea, um, they, it's more like um, industrial estate for food company. Whereas Food Innopolis, we do not allow manufacturing. We only allow R&D um, activities in, in our uh, premise. And also in this region, we have one in um, New Zealand, uh, which is Food Innovation Network in New Zealand, where they provide facility and infrastructures for food companies to use and um, do uh, more development uh, their product. So the concept of Food Innopolis, we study um, several um, food innovation hub. For example, Food uh, Valley, I have mentioned that. Uh, another place is um, Vitagora in France, pretty much similar to Food Valley. These two places, they don't have infrastructures. They manage the network. They provide the service. They act at the linkage um, uh, organization. Whereas um, another, another two places that we study, I mentioned about f um, Food Innovation Network or FIN in New Zealand. They provide facility and infrastructures and also R&Ds um, uh, researchers to help our company to develop their product. Um, where um, in Agro Food Park in Denmark, it's more like um, the model that we develop. But we know food, uh, Agro Food Park actually after we are uh, up and running Food Innopolis, they, they have facilities and they also have services uh, to provide for food company. So um, we after study all this model and uh, we kind of mix and blend all this concept and uh, create Food Innopolis and we, we are proud to say that it's the only comprehensive food innovation platform for um, ASEAN. Um, how we do that? Um, we do not do it alone. We have the memorandum of understandings amongst private company, universities and government agencies. 16 private company, 23 universities and um, 12 government agencies. And um, how we work with them, we work, we apply the concept of open innovation platform. That means we act, we ourselves as a platform to link and to plug in all the players and all stakeholders to provide uh, services for uh, food industry. Um, the three areas that we focus is um, health and functional food, um, high value added food products. And um, the third one is supporting business for food innovation. This is all to, uh, fo this is our focus areas, but it doesn't mean that we only do this, we do other things as well. But to be focused, these are the three uh, main focus areas of uh, Food Innopolis. So we provide uh, ease of doing business for the company. We provide service platform, which I will elaborate in the next slides. And we have one sub-service for R&D and also um, tax and non-tax incentive for the company. And also um, the Competitive Advance Enhancement Act, uh, or we call it BOI++, which uh, would be a kind of a matching fund for a food company. But they have to do um, several kind of merits. One of these, for example, human resource development, R&Ds and innovation, or technology transfer, or working with um, academic institute. And um, this fund is 300 um, million US dollars and is the matching fund um, from the government. And apart from that, we also have uh, uh, others, uh, policies and mechanisms for um, company doing R&D. That is the 300% tax exemptions uh, for R&Ds and innovation expenditures that company spends. And also we have a talent mobility program where um, we support company, especially SME, to uh, have uh, university researchers to mobilize themselves to work with the company. And if the SMEs, we also support the, um, the 
the money that you have to pay for the, uh, for the faculty members as well. And also we provide innovation vouchers for SME and another program that um, company have been using a lot is uh, ITAP, it's Innovation and Technology Assistance Program for SMEs, where we um, help the SME develop their uh, products and also process. Another thing that just came out from the government is um, we call it Smart Visa, where we uh, these uh, policies measures is to attract new talents uh, to work in, in Thailand in the areas of uh, um, R&D. And this is what I just mentioned. That's what I will elaborate more. What is uh, Soviet platform of Food Inopolis? So um, Food Inopolis actually do two things. We provide facility and infrastructures for R&D activity for food company. That is one. And the others is uh, we provide soft services for companies. So these are the services that we provide. We have one stop service and help desk, where it's actually the first place where um, company contact us. We talk with company, and then we help to, uh, we talk back and forth uh, several times and see what they really needs or what actually their problems. Sometimes they come to us with one thing, but actually after uh, working with each other, there's another thing. So this is the place that where we, we um, is the starting point for the company. The others are uh, service platform, for example, the uh, global network. We know that linking with um, knowledge resources internationally, sometimes it's difficult for company, for ex especially SMEs. So we help to network with this um, international knowledge resources and bring in their um, expertise to Thailand. And uh, we organize several uh, workshop and events, uh, particularly uh, with uh, Fraunhofer in Germany. We have done uh, twice the workshop in food safety, uh, food contact materials, and also um, food automation and sensors for food technologies. Um, the other platform is facilities, where we provide uh, facility for doing R&D. And uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is uh, Future Food Labs. Future Food Lab is the space, uh, R&D space for SMEs to, to use for a certain period of time. And also, we provide the course for these Future Labs, because normally, Facility and infrastructure that Food Inopolis provide is on a rental basis. But we know that SME don't have, uh, sometimes they can't afford uh, renting the space, so we allow them to stay for six months or no longer than one, one year, but they have to have a specific project, what kind of product they want to develop, and we equip that with the research course to help them develop the new product out to the market. Um, other platform which I have to admit that we haven't done much, which is the nutrition and food safety. As I mentioned, we just start half, uh, mid of uh, last year. This platform, we would try to work with uh, Mahidon University as a key uh, partner. Um, also for the FDA service platform, we are working with Forstat and uh, Thai FDA to um, strengthening the capabilities um, in the food uh, registrations in, uh, for all uh, stakeholder researchers, um, food companies, and also experts. So this is a three years program for capability buildings uh, with uh, Foresight and FDA. And for academy, we actually have three types of um, activity under this platform. Flavor Academy is the, we organize a, a training and a workshop to develop or to help to groom what we call flavor scientists because we know that if you want to come up with a novel food product or new food product, you have to add a lot of food ingredients and flavors in that. And actually this is very important that we have to to have the one who really know um, in this uh, flavor science. So it, this is one of the uh, academy that we develop. Um, knowledge Forum is more on the market trend and the business aspect of food um, industry. 
and for the cutting edge technology is the event where we organize uh, technical knowledge that related with food um, innovation. So the three uh, activities of uh, academy platform is kind of uh, different and target at uh, different uh, customer and focus in differently. Um, this is um, to show the, a bit of numbers how we uh, service the company. Um, right now we have about almost 200 companies contact us and about 70 or 80 have visited as our uh, facilities and 42 companies, this is the number um, in uh, November and I would say over almost 18 months, a year and a half, we have been serviced about uh, 42 companies and the study show that the company that come to us, what they're looking for, they're looking for a research, uh, researchers and experts at the most. And um, Future Food Lab, I already mentioned that. And um, also not, not only uh, SME, we also, we also have our startups uh, platform as well. So we have Food Inopolis, uh, Innovation Contest, Ignite Program, and uh, Hacking Food, all these target for food startup company. And this is the numbers of uh, company that located at Food Inopolis. So we have uh, 35 TNN already. And um, actually, at over 18 months, we've been able to have the new 13 company located on site. Uh, we have existing company, 22 company that located at Thailand Size Park. So all together is 35. In Thailand Size Park, we have right now about 80 companies. So I would say out of 80 companies, 35 companies are food and food related company. So this is um, the model of uh, Thailand Size Park. So as I mentioned that the government um, endorsed Food Inopolis mid of last year. We don't have time to build up the facility. So we allocate one of the building at Thailand Size Park to accommodate Food Inopolis. So we jump start the Food Inopolis from there where we um, be in the proximity with uh, NASDA, National Science Technology Development Agency and also the four national research centers. We provide modular design labs and also ready to move in laboratories. So it's uh, more like an ecosystem, uh, innovation ecosystem for uh, R&D company. Um, and our building is the special design facility for R&D. It's not, it not office building, so it can accommodate our special uh, requirement, for example, sensitive labs or heavy equipment area. And um, on site, we also have food and feed innovation centers where, uh, where um, we can help in uh, R&D contract and R&D collaborative project with the company. So the site is uh, located at Thailand Size Park on 80 acres of land and Food Inopolis have about 60,000 um, square meters that we can ac accommodate our food company. Uh, we also have the plan to work with a local university in Bangkok as well, Sri Lankan University, Mahidol University, and uh, Kasetsan University, also King Mungkut University of Technologies in all of that three sites. And uh, we have Tista and uh, Nims T uh, in the map as well because there are also agency under Ministry of Science and Technology and also the stakeholders of Food Inopolis. We have the plan to develop Food Inopolis in the regional areas in the north, northeast and south with the same concept of jumping start from uh, Thailand Size Park. So we use the facility of regional size park to jump start a regional uh, network of Food Inopolis. So this would be in the next, uh, this year we will start the, this project and um, we will we'll see uh, the activities in the regional area maybe um, later in this year and next years. Um, so this is just um, to see, to show the facilities that we have and uh, I think that's come to the end of my presentation and um, uh, if you allow the time at the end of the talk I can entertain your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Akanong. That's so interesting. I mean, what you're doing here in Thailand is on such a big scale. I've actually used the facility in Auckland, 
um, uh, which you mentioned. So we call it football, and it's amazing. We but um, it's more a place where they have infrastructure and uh, very expensive e equipments that you can use. And um, it's been a wonderful facility uh, for New Zealand. So uh, I look forward to you know uh, getting an opportunity to see this food in our place that you're establishing in Bangkok. Well done. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Nancy David Yuliana from Bogor. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, Department of Food Science and Technology, Bogo Agricultural University in Indonesia. It's a very um, renowned university for food science. I'm, I'm teaching food science and I know quite a few of my colleagues come from there. And she will be talking about future food, issues and challenges of halal forensic science. So please give a round of applause for Dr. Nancy. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Prof. Nazima, for nice introduction. So, I will give a talk about the issues and challenges of halal forensic science. Oh, before that, thank you so much for the steering committee for this nice opportunity. So, I will start with a small introduction, but I think everybody already know about this that the growth of Muslim population is much faster than non-Muslim population. So for some companies, of course, this means a huge market, yeah, potential market, and we can see that uh, the demand about halal food is increasing time to time. But actually, an increase in this halal demand is not solely because of the fast growth of Muslim population, but this is also because of an increase in Muslim consumer awareness, so the Muslim consumer now, they have a better understanding that the halal status of their product they, that they consume is not only depend on the nature or the origin of the material, but also many factors as, such as the processing method, how the product is being storage, how the product is being distributed can also impact to the halal status of uh, their food. So these factors must be complied with halal dietary law but the problem is how to confirm this. One of uh, the things that we can do yeah, to confirm this uh, compliance is, for example, by conducting halal certification. Nowadays, there are many halal certification bodies worldwide, not only in the country where the Muslim is a major, but also in some country where, where the Muslim is a minority, such in Thailand, yeah, you also have SISOT, or the, in, in USA, you have uh, Ivanka, yeah, and so on. All of these halal certifier body, most of them, they put the same requirement that before issuing the halal certificate, they have to conduct halal audit on site first to prove that the product is made from halal material as registered to the halal certifier body. So most of them also have almost similar protocol. Before they conduct the audit, the companies has to submit many documentation, for example, name of the product to be certified, and then list of materials, and then halal certificate for halal critical material they use to produce the halal product, and also the flow process or the certificate of analysis of the materials. And then the halal auditor will do the physical checking at the site, they will check the production facility, the warehouse, etc. And also they will check the administration system in the company, they will check how the company do the purchasing material, whether they have standard product formulation, whether they have production record, whether they have stock card, and whether they, ca they have a good traceability so the final product can be traced back to the raw materials or from raw materials can be traced forward to the final product. However, even though most of the certifier body, they have a very good protocol in conducting health audit, but still, it is possible that failures in health certification could occur. In this case, maybe we read in the news that some halal registered product, halal certified product was found as not halal in a market. This is because of some many reasons. Yeah? Uh, for example, it is possible that uh, there is violation in using halal certificate or halal logo. So many certificates, yeah, commonly it is valid 
for one or three years, for example, and during this period, according to the agreement, the company cannot change their materials. Everything should be the same, like what they agree with the health certifier body. But sometimes they they just change it without any information to the certifier body, or they change also the vendors. And you know, the same material, but different vendors might have different flowchart. So the halal status of the same material produced by different vendors might also different. It is also possible that they make a fake halal certificate. So maybe the certificate is expired, but they, they don't want to renew the certificate. So they just erase the expired date and replace with the new date. Also, it is possible contamination occurs during production, during storage, during distribution, and during serving, especially if the company has two versions of product, halal and non-halal. So in Indonesia, because I also work for EPPOM MUR, the highest certified body in Indonesia, to prevent this failure, we have several methods. Yeah. So before the company register for halal certificate, they have to set up the halal assurance system. So this is the system they have to implement in their company in order to prevent the certificate violation. And during the audit, we will inspect how they implement this system and then we will give them the something like the grade. And when the audit finish, besides halal certificate, we will also give them this grade. Yeah? If they can get A and they can uh, maintain this grade for three renewals, we will give them the Halal Assurance System Certificate, which is valid for four years. And during these four years, we also still uh, follow their track. Yeah? It is possible we check them, we visit the company to do unscheduled inspection, and also we might take some samples from the market belong to the respective company and then conduct laboratory analysis. In my country, according to standard of EPPOM MUI, uh, the lab analysis is compulsory for only uh, several types of products, particularly for the beverages, especially fermented beverages, and also the flavor which use ethanol as a solvent for this product. We require the company to conduct ethanol residue analysis. And also, uh, we require the company to conduct pork residual analysis for meat and meat derivative products. So, from the last point, we can see that uh, analytical tools is also important to support this HALA certifier body to do their task. Currently, there are many analytical tools used for HALA authentication. Uh, some of them I will explain here. For example, spectroscopic method like FTIR or NMR. These two methods, they have uh, advantages because they can be used to analyze the target compound present in the mixture. But for FTIR, it only can recognize the functional group of the molecular target. However, this FTIR is uh, very affordable. It's cheap and uh, the, uh, the sample preparation is very simple, non-destructive, and very fast analysis. I think one sample only needs for one or two minutes. NMR, also the same. It can analyze the target compound in the mixture. Even it can give also molecular structure information. And the same like FTIR, the sample preparation is very simple, and the analysis time is very short. However, NMR is much more expensive. And also, it has some problem with sensitivity, especially if we compare to MS or the PCR method based. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Other method is electronic, electronic nose. Usually, uh, this method used together with GC or MS. Uh, also, this method is very good because it is non-destructive, very fast, and can be used to analyze a mixture, but it's only focused on four tiles compound. Next is chromatographic technique, for example, GC, HPLC, or UPLC. Uh, this method is also quite affordable, yeah, but for GC, for example, it only focuses on four tiles, and this method has also disadvantages because the sample preparation is uh, quite complex. 
Next is differential scanning calorimetric. So this method based on the thermal behavior of different compounds in the food system, like a melting point, crystallization point when we increase and we decrease the temperature. This method also have a simple sample preparation. And the last, I think this is the most popular one, uh, molecular biology techniques. For example, DNA barcoding or different type of PCR method. So this method is uh, preferable for some researcher because they are targeting on protein or DNA which can survive against harsh processing condition. But again, the limitation if is they have an elaborative sample preparation to do. So if you have a lot of samples, then it's uh, quite problematic. So I want to give a special impression to some method like NMR, FTIR, electronic nose, and differential scanning calorimetry because this instrumentation is very useful for high throughput analysis because they are able to analyze broad range of compounds from non-polar to the polar one. Uh, but because of that, then the data resulted from these analytical tools are quite high dimension. So then we need multivariate data analysis to extract information from the data. For example, by using principal component analysis and partial least square analysis. So when we use this method, usually the data is presented in the form of score plot, where we can see the classification or the grouping of our sample. When the researcher use this method, usually they make two type of calibration group. First, they will have uh, the halal group. So this is a sample which is only made from the halal materials. And secondly, they will have non-halal group where they mix the sample made from halal material and then they mix with non-halal material at different con concentration. And then they will take sample commercial, commercially available and then they will see the pattern, the grouping of this group. If it is close to the halal group means it is okay. But if it is close to the non-halal group, then we have a question about the halal status. Now I want to give se several examples of uh, research concerning this method I just explained. I tried to search for the last five years' papers. So the first one is the paper, the research on the use of NMA for halal authentication. This is the work from Malaysian group. So they use NMA spectroscopy and multivariate data analysis to see uh, to the, see the differentiation between 100% butter and then butter which is replaced by 50% lard and 100% lard. So they can see the good separation between those three groups and then in the next study they try to find the marker from the halal butter and from butter contaminated with the lard. And then they use the HPLC to conduct quantitative analysis of each marker. So here they find several markers for butter, 100%, and lard, 100%. It consists of several types of fatty acid. Next is uh, the paper uh, where they use the FTIR for halal authentication. So here this is the collaborative paper from Malaysia and Indonesia. They try to use FTIR and modify data analysis to differentiate samples meatballs. So meatball is a very famous street food in Indonesia. But sometimes they also do cheating and they claim this is beef meatball, but actually they use other meat. So they can observe different cluster based on FTIR data between uh, beef meatballs and meatballs which is contaminated by lard. And they try to check some commercial samples, fortunate, uh, and fortunately there is no contaminated samples was found. And the second study also the same, even you see in Indonesia, they they can use red meat to make meatballs and then they claim it's a beef meatball. So here they can detect some commercial meatballs are clustered together close to the red meatballs. So then we have question about the high status of those meatball samples. This is still about FTIR for halal authentication. This is from Korean group. They try to differentiate between uh, Chinese ham sausage made from non-halal -ha animal and the one made from halal animal. Also, by using multivariate data analysis, they can see that 
uh, sausage made from the non-halal animal is very separated from the halal animal uh, sausage. This is about the use of the SG or differential scanning calorimetry for halal authentication. So by using this method, we can see the thermal profiling of different ingredients. Here they try to see the different uh, thermogram uh, of 100% butter, lard, and butter substituted with 1 to 80% lard. And indeed, they have different profile of therm thermogram. And this is the group from Korean still. So here they use the electronic nose coupled to GCMS to screen some fermented soy sauce due to ethanol residue content. You know, in several countries, there are different, different regulations about this ethanol residue. In Indonesia, for example, for consumer group, the ethanol residue should be undetectable. But maybe in some country, it still allow uh, some until some limit. So here, it is a good idea to screen the sample first to detect or to judge whether they are eligible for HALA certification. They use this uh, electronic news nose to screen several samples uh, and the, the method was able to detect soy sauce and other content at the very low level. This is still the same, they use electronic nose for pork detection and they can show that a uh, sample contain pork and other animals, they do have different thermogram profile. Uh, the last is PCR. Yeah, PCR, of course, everybody like it because it's very sensitive. But as I mentioned, it's very difficult for sample preparation. Here, the group from, I think this is uh, from Malaysia also. Malaysia did a lot of research about halal. So they use uh, multiplex PCR assay, which in one running, they can uh, analyze different uh, animals, uh, derivative. So here they analyze the presence of pig, dog, cat, monkey, and rat in process meat by using this multiplex PCR assay. And also, the other, in another study, they use PCR for halal authentication for gelatin. You know, gelatin is made by very harsh method, by involving high uh, temperature and very low or very high pH. So, but by using this PCR, they can differentiate the profile of porcine gelatin and bovine gelatin and the mixture of this uh, ingredient. So we can see that in the previous samples of research, actually they applied the analytical method mostly in a very simple food metric. But actually in the real life, the situation is not so simple. I worked for LPOM MUI for many years and during the audit we found that many, many ingredients are a minor component in the food and they are made from the mixture of plant, animal, microbial and synthetic chemicals. For example, like uh, this emulsifier, Twin60, I think this is uh, one of the most widely used emulsifier. It is uh, the name, the chemical name is polyoxyethylene sorbitan monosterate. So it is made from chemicals and then from microbial and also for animal fat. And then this ingredient will be added to the food system. Yeah, so we don't know what is the concentration of the emulsifier is there. Is it able to detect, uh, can we detect the source of this monocellate, for example, or this sorbitan? Also, many, many biotechnology techniques used to produce food ingredients and is it able to detect the gene obtained from non-halal or halal animal? And also, there are also problems with improper handling, like can we detect if the animal claim as halal thought that they uh, stunning properly, or maybe they died after stunning but before slaughtered? Can we have a method to detect this uh, accident? Also, can we know that animal is handled kindly before the slaughtering or do they have some stress because of the bad treatment and so on. So this is what we need in the future. We need uh, methods, analytical methods which can enter all of this, able to trace target molecule in minute amount, able to trace a target molecule in a complex mixture or if the molecule has been transformed into different molecule due to processing method and the method should be fast, it should be cheap and the sample preparation should be easy. So as a conclusion, 
Halal Food Analytical Science is very important to support the credibility of halal certification program. You know that some halal issue cannot solely solve by on-site halal audit only, but we need lab analysis to support this. But similarly, also not all issue cannot be solely solved by lab analysis. To address this, we still need to do paperwork to trace the origin of material, like we have to collect the flowchart, the HAL certificate, the COA, etc. And when we come to this limit, so when it is not possible anymore to trace the material, the source of the material, then we need the fatwa from our ulama. For example, in Indonesia, we have one fatwa from our ulama about the status of, uh, like for example, this ingredient, benzyl butyrate. It is uh, obtained from the reaction between benzyl alcohol, which is purely chemicals, and butyric acid, which is a fatty acid, which can come from animal or from plant or from microbial fermentation. If it is from plant, of course it is okay. If it is from plant, uh, from animal, then we need to know about the status of the animal and how they were slaughtered. But if the butyric acid is come from fermentation, I don't think it's possible to trace until the media fermentation because I think we follow the presentation from Dr. Dasser yesterday. If microbial product, and we must know the composition of the media. If this is as ingredients, mono ingredients, I don't think it is possible. So for this kind of case, in Indonesia, the ulama said this is okay when the microbial uh, product react with chemicals and then we don't need to ask about the fermentation media. So I think uh, this is the end of my presentation. I would like to thank again for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Nancy. Yeah. That was a really good talk, yeah, co covering uh, the general uh, ideas of halal certification in Indonesia and the various methods that could be applied in halal analysis. So that was a very good overview. Our next speaker is an expert um, uh, who's working at CIMIC, uh, he, a general secretariat in Turkey. He's none other than Mr. Chara Jankutaran and I got the name right, so I'm quite pleased. But um, uh, he's going to talk about the roles and responsibility of CIMIC on halal scientific methodology. So please give a round of applause to Mr. Chara. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon. All and assalamu alaikum to all. Uh, my presentation will be about the methodology uh, that we are following in the development of the halal standard, especially OSM halal standards. And I will start with the brief introduction of the OIC and our institution CIMIC, Quality Infrastructure Standardization and the Global Halal Standards on the Halal Issues. The OIC is the collective mis voice of the Muslim world and it is the second largest intergovernmental organization after the United Nations is based in Saudi Arabia and it has 57 member states over the four continents and our institution TIMIC is an intergovernmental organization and it is you know, affiliated to the OIC it's a regional standardization body like RSO, GSO maybe you already heard about it. It's established in 2010 in Istanbul, and it is not a certification body, a special remark. Uh, as I mentioned before, OIC has 57 member states, and up to date, we have 39 member states out of this 57. And very recently, we have uh, uh, accepted the membership application of Qatar, Kuwait, and Cote d'Ivoire. And you can access the updated list at our website. Uh, the, the main objectives, especially the main objectives, is the preparation of the OICMIC standards. And we are also working in the methodology and accreditation uh, to achieve university in the methodology laboratory testing and to provide technical assistance to 
the member states and to establish conformity assessment schemes. Uh, we have strategic plan, you know, this was approved last year. We have five main strategy and under all of them, 33 strategies we have. Uh, and we are working and following up the implementation of these strategies you know, in our working plan. This is organization chart. Uh, we have General Assembly, the Supreme Decision Making Organ, and the Board of Directors, and related with the most technical issues. And we have, as I mentioned before, standardization, meteorology, and accreditation, three organs and the councils to govern them. Uh, to mention our the mandate under OIC, we have to refer to quality infrastructure. Quality infrastructure defines covers standardization, metrology, and accreditation, and conformity assessment. As CIMIC, we cover three of them, standardization, metrology, and accreditation. And this is a system of institutions. Uh, we jointly ensure that the products and processes meet the predefined specifications, and these are the standards. You know, as you see in this slide, this is a national uh, quality infrastructure, and the Governments are responsible for the establishment and implementing. But if you look at the dash line, all of them depends on a standard. All nation standards, by the prepaid standards for accreditation, the metrology, testing, and all the issues. So standardization is very important for the certification process. And these are the, some of the impacted uh, the impact you know, expected from the quality infrastructure, you, you know, you see the activities, and all of them depends on again standardization, and there are lots of impacts, you know, economies of scale, efficiency, or et economic integration like this. So, as I mentioned, in CIMIC, the main the mandate is to develop the standards, and. First of all, we have to define the standard. The standard is a document which defines the must of a product, service, or process. So, while we are defining, it should be established by consensus and it should be accepted, approved by recognized body. You know, everyone is talking about standards, but if we say something standard, it should be approved by a recognized body, which is chemic in this case, and it should be contributed for stakeholders and it's voluntary and it should be common and repeated use. It, this is, in this slide you can see the contribution of the stakeholders while we are preparing the standards because the development of standards is not only the job of the people working in the office of the CIMIC. So we are inviting all of them uh, to contribute in the standard development procedure. And we have the SMC standards, the management council, a very recently established organ of the CIMIC. This is the responsible for development and maintenance of the OIC CIMIC standards in cooperation with the uh, member states. As I mentioned, you know, we are not the people that is developing standard in the office. We have technical committees and uh, standardization are being, you know, Develop under these TCs and technical committees have a title, scope, a working program, and they have also a business plan. Uh, they have uh, uh, the rules defined in the directives. They have to have secretary, chairman, and experts and invited observers. And as I mentioned, we are obliged to obey the rules in the directives, the procedures for technical work we have the rules for structure and drafting of the standards, and we have adoption guides, we have documents, and we are obliged to obey these documents. And in developing standards, we have the project approach, uh, and this is approach is intent to lead the issue of a new amended of or a revised OICMIC standards. Is, is standards preparation is not an easy job, as you see, it, it has some stages, six stages, starting from the proposal and preparatory stage, committee, inquiry stage, approval stage, and all of them are being done 
by the experts and contribution of the CIMIC member states. And it's again in line with the implementation of the OS, you know, ISO impl implementations. And we have, you know, CIMIC information system, a web based system that can ease, that is uh, the contribution of the member state. We can do many things. CIMIC IS, we can start the projects and we can open to voting, balloting, we can execute all the system as. CIMIC IS. And this is the list of the technical committees that we have established until so far. CIMIC is not an institution working on non PELAL. We have different sectors and we have standards on a special, for example, in occupational health, as an example. And these are the standards that have been established so far, three of them are related with the halal and fifth of them uh, with the occupation is safety and the port standard will be related with the with the halal cosmetic inshallah it will be released very soon and we have committees uh, one of them is the CIMIC committee and conformity assessment this is the committee that is working on development of the certification and accreditation standards for those bodies and this is uh, the the scope is, uh, as I mentioned, the preparation of guides and standards on bodies testing, calibration, certification, inspection, accreditation, and other related stars, especially on the halal conformity assessment and accreditation guidelines. We have some projects like this certification of the personal in health certification. And it's expectation from uh, the laboratories, you know, halal testing laboratories, and the recognition, the arrangements for the recognition and acceptance of the halal conformant assessment certificates. And we are planning to develop certification scheme for the halal products. You know, these are, these are uh, expectations and the proposal coming from the member states. And as I mentioned, we have standards on halal, you know. Uh, the basis of uh, the standards, you know, of course, is coming from the Islamic rules and laws and Sharia, but standards are not a fixed documents. I'm a food engineer, you know, the standards are technical documents, you know, developed by the experts, but we can refer the Islamic Fiqh Academy uh, if we need uh, information or fatwa issues. and. If we believe that halal certification is an added value to the products, especially. As mentioned before, like the other standards, all halal standards also should be established by consensus, approved by, recognized by the likes CIMIC. And as we development of these existing standards, it, there were contribution of the more than 36 member states of the OIC. So these standards also uh, developed by the contribution of the stakeholders. And to, these are the standards. It is three standards, three standards. One for the manufacturer, OSMIC 1. OSMIC 2 is for certification bodies. And OSMIC 3 is the accreditation bodies. Defining on the rules and it's in line with the you know, ISO uh, standards that is issued for the conformance assessment and activities. Uh, you know, OIC Mix 1 basically defines the requirements of Pelal Foods and its products, the preparation, processing, packaging, storage, and every all of them. OIC Mix 2, as I mentioned, uh, defines the requirements for the halal certification bodies that the rules that the AGSPs have to obey or follow, and to ensure that the uh, halal certification but these operates you know, halal products, service management in a competent, consistent, and impartial manner. And OIC MIG 3 is related uh, the rules of the halal accreditation body, the, the main rules that the halal certification body in should, should be in OIC member countries or in those countries trading with OIC members countries or in another co country. As I showed before, 
this is again a brief introduction of the quality structure. They seem different, but they, you know, uh, together could be two, could be evaluated together. Mm, it's like connecting each other, uh, and you know, standards for metrology testing certification. Actually, all of them rely on the standards, and this is a the brief uh, the picture of the position of the simic. This is a halal chain from farm to port, and in every stage, the, from the manufacturing, processing, certification, analysis, and testing, inspection, and all uh, of the steps, we have a, you know OIC CIMIC standards, and we have also the organs of CIMIC, like CIMIC Accreditation Council, CIMIC Meteorology Council. So it's important picture as CIMIC, we are developing s standards for, I mean, uh, the food itself and for uh, certification, for accreditation and other issues. Inshallah, it will be in the upcoming terms. I mean, standards will be released for testing laboratories and inspection or the reference material, Inshallah. Uh, so the current situation as in the three standards we are expecting that the production should be in compliance with the OICMIC standards the manufacturers should obey and the HELA certification bodies should obey the OICMIC 2 standards and you know it makes certification according to the OICMIC MARS standard and the accreditation bodies should work according to the OICMIC 3 standard and Certify, you know, you know, accredited according to the OIC two standard, and this will be say that this the implementation of OIC halal standard will benefit, like the increase of consumer trust and halal, the mutual recognition, traceability, and diminishing technical barriers to trade. As a conclusion, we say that. The OISM PELA standards are the result of a common study of OIC member states and institutions. And we define ourselves as a common platform to work and to set the standards for the benefit of the Ummah. And we are saying that these standards will be for the benefit of all the Muslim world and interested parties. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Chara. That was a wonderful overview of the role of CIMIC yeah, in establishing uh, standards for halal authentication. So, um, we'll go on to our next speaker, and it is no, none other than Dr. Charan Yafa. Yes, Dr. Charan is Assistant Head of Chemical Metrology and Biometry. He is at the Department of Chemical, Metrology and Biometry Department in Thailand. It's based in Bangkok, is it? Yeah, all right. So, Mr. Ch uh, Dr. Charan will be talking about... Um, sorry. Uplift of halal scientific infrastructures in non-Muslim countries. So, please give a round of uh, applause to Dr. Charan to welcome him for his talk. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jaran Yafa. I'm working at the National Institute of Metrology, Thailand. My talk today, I will give a bit of introduction and then I will go on directly to the national infrastructure. I will focus on the MSTQ. I will go by, by letters and then the metrology for halal certification. So as you know that Thailand is one of the country that famous for food. We have very very many type of food and people enjoy food. My friends from other countries 
come to Thailand. They enjoy Thai food very much. But our Muslim colleagues from another countries, when they come to Thailand, it's difficult to find food in Thailand. Halal, halal food is difficult. So we need to look for something like this. We need to look for something like the certification, the halal symbol, something like this. Is it okay? Yes, I presume. When I go to Malaysia or Indonesia, it's easy to find food. They said everything is halal. But here in Bangkok or in Thailand, it's difficult. This is the way that we should go. We need some, some, something that we can ensure that this food or these products is halal for us. So, in other areas, like in the agricultural products here. When you do have the products here, the products come from farm, going to the processing, the packaging, and then transport to the market. We need to make sure that the market, the, the products here in the, at the market is comply with the specification or technical issue or directives or standards here. Yeah. How can we make sure that someone need to certify this product? This product, vegetable, is comply with this stan certain standard here yeah, or comply with the laws. We need organization certification body here to certify the products. In order to help the certification body, to certify the products, we need inspection body. Inspection body come to check the products from time to time, to check that if this lot of the products is complied to the law or the standard or not. In order to help the certification body, they need testing laboratory. Testing laboratory is the one who tests the products, if it's complied to the standard, let's say if this products, if the standard say this vegetable should not contain pesticides, the testing lab is the one that tests the products. There is no pesticide. How can the testing lab be sure of their result? The testing lab needs the calibration laboratory. The calibration laboratory provide calibration services to testing laboratory here to make sure that the test result is correct. They need time to time, they need proficiency testing. You call it proficiency testing. It's kind of round robin. We send sample around and they, this lab tests the sample, this lab tests the sample, this lab tests the sample. Every lab tests the same sample and if they got the correct result, that is the PT. So, also, apart from PT, the testing lab here need reference material, certified reference material to calibrate their instrument, to validate their measurement method here in the testing lab. So, this activity is covered by the National Metrology Institute and supervised by the global organization like BIPM or APMP in this region. In the area of accreditation, in the area of accreditation, the certification body need to do the ISO IEC guide 65. The inspection body, they need to have the quality system 17020. The laboratory, they need the quality system as well, 17025. And also the PT provider, 17043, reference material producer, 17034. This is the general quality system that everybody here need. And this is provided by the accreditation body. And the accreditation body, they have the global organization that look after them as well. So by this way, we make sure that the product here is complied by the standard 
or by the law or the regulation. You must know that this scheme is for voluntary base only, not the compulsory. But this is to make sure that the product here is safe and comply to the standard. Now, we go on to the quality infrastructure. The word quality infrastructure here has been adopted by the, the network of DCMAS. This is the network on the accreditation, standardization for developing countries. The definition of this is the, the quality infrastructure is the system that needed to support and enhance the quality, safety, and environment soundness of goods, services, and process. This is the definition of quality infrastructure. It rely on metrology, standardization, accreditation, conformity assessment, and also market surveillance. So normally, if you look forward the national quality infrastructure, you will see standardization, metrology, testing, accreditation, or quality management. This is the pillars that support the economy of the countries. National quality infrastructure is the same things as the infrastructure in the countries. Normally, if you talk about the infrastructure, you will think about the road, the railway, the building, something like that. But here, quality infrastructure means something that we provide to support the quality of food, quality of services or products. The key player is here. There are three big organizations here. The metrology people, the standardization, and accreditation. Here, the metrology, they need to make, they need to make sure that all the measurements in the country are reliable. The standardization here, to make sure that every product has the specification and also they set up the specification, dimension or things like that for the products. And also the accreditation people, the accreditation people come to check whether the specification here is met or not. Here. The, the definition of standardization here. The definition of standardization, I would divide it into two, two terms. Process standardization. Process standardization is the consistency of the work sequence. Yeah. To make sure everything go along with the way that we, we provide. And also here, product standardization. The example of product standardization is here. Previously, you think about the mobile plug. Many type of mobile here. But now, we come to agree that only one type of mobile charger one is enough. Previously, there are many. This is specification, specification, specification. Then, every specification agree that there should be something like this. This is the one that sh we should work for. So, product standardization is the process of setting generally information characteristic for particular goods or services. That is the way we do for standardization. For testing laboratory, testing, normally we need something like this. Good precision and good accuracy. This is what we need. Sometimes we need the laboratory. The laboratory here might be good enough to test the products. The testing lab here analyze the properties, ingredients, or characteristics of products. So if we need to make sure that these products contain no impurity from pork for halal products. We need to go to the laboratory here. And the laboratory here should be okay. For the testing laboratory, they need quality management, quality system from the sample, from the sample that come into the lab. 
until they issue the report. They need to make sure that every step involved in the laboratory is doing well, is correct, starting from sampling, analysis, equipment, quality control, measurement method, environment condition, and sample handling. We need to make sure that the lab here is suitable for analysis of something. The quality management is the reliable application of quality standard. Also, for the laboratory, they need some things to make sure that the laboratory provide the reliable testing or result here. The laboratory should be accredited by the accreditation body. The accreditation body, in every country we have the accreditation body. They have the mutual recognition arrangement with each other, with other country as well. In this way, we, need, we can make sure that the laboratory do here, provide a good result with the other laboratory in other country as well. So, in the accreditation, we have the laboratory, we have the inspection body, and also we have certification body to make sure that the products or services or management personnel or, ma or management or personnel comply to some certain standard here. This is the way that we make sure that every product or every service is conform with the products, with the products requirements. Here is the metrology. The metrology provides the comparability of measurement results. We make sure that if we measure the impurity of pork, of the, the contaminant like pork in meat products here, if we measure in this country, the result is, compare, is comparable with the other countries. So in this way, we, we, can, we can make sure that we do analysis here, they do analysis there, the result is comparable, no need to replicate the measurement. The metrology provides that kind of standard to make sure that the result is comparable. In terms of metrology for halals, industry, we need some certified reference material. At the moment, the National Institute of Metrology Thailand is planning to produce certified reference material for gelatin, polar compounds, pork DNA, ethyl alcohol, fatty acids, and porcelain collagen to help the laboratory to make sure that their lab provide the good result, the reliable result for calibration of instrument and for validation of measurement method and also for use as quality control in their laboratory as well. So we support the accreditation and also we help the quality system. This is the quality infrastructure for some country like Thailand here. The Halal certificate here was issued by the Islamic organization here, Provincial Islamic Central and also the Central Islamic Council of Thailand can issue the halal certificate. So in this way, the Metrology Institute will provide the metrological services like reference material, provision testing or PT scheme to help the religious people to be able to do the certify of Halal certificate by work together with Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, to support in the technical area in the issue of Halal certificate. So, I would like to conclude my presentation with this proposal of the concept for quality infrastructure for Halal products here. So, this is the Halal products here. We can use our existing facility, its existing quality infrastructure, the certification body, inspection body, testing laboratory, calibration laboratory, PT provider, and reference material. That already exists in the country or available in the country to support the halal certification here. So we need halal standard here. The halal standard here already available. The one problem is 
we need someone like Islamic accreditation body like a CMIX here might help to support the industry here or we, we do not know if we can use the existing accreditation body in the country to support the halal industry or we have another support another entity to support the halal industry we do not know yet but we can talk about this later so that's all for my presentation i think you know something about the quality infrastructure to help the halal certificate thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Charan. That was a very impressive explanation on the national quality infrastructure and how it's used to support testing and certification of halal products. Our next speaker is actually from the Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, and she's a research assistant there. Uh, she is Ms. Sunaini Mahama, and she's going to give a talk on the application of the next generation of uh, sequencing techniques for identification of halal and halal meat products adulterated with haram species. Please welcome Ms. Sunaini. Thank you for uh, Dr. Nasima for kindly introduce uh, First of all, uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Winay Dahlan and uh, Director of Halan Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, and Dr. Uh, Ashari, who gave me a chance to be a speaker today. Uh, today, I will, uh, I'm Sunaini Muhammad. I'm a research in the uh, Department of Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University. Today, what I would like to talk about in uh, today, I would like to talk uh, Thailand, uh, halal food safety in the Thailand and authenticity of the Thailand. And what kind of Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, uh, Halal Forensics Laboratory do to detect haram adulterations uh, based on DNA technique and the future uh, application of next generation sequencing for halal food safety. Uh, all are, uh, the global Muslim live in all the, around the world, but the most, more than 60% live in the Asia Pacific and about 20% live in the Middle East or not and not Africa. More than 300 million of Muslim, they are living in non-Muslim country like a Thailand. As a Dr. Ad Anong said before, Thailand will be uh, in the top five range for the food agriculture industry. Uh, just, sorry. And uh, most of product from the Thailand we are export to the another country in non-Muslim in Muslim country and non-Muslim country. So uh, for the interpreter, they they have to know what the halal certification or halal about halalness. And there are so many scandal that found meat adulterations uh, in the food product more than uh, for the first few years like uh, substitution of buffalo meat with uh, another species or in the China have a fa food found using murine meat uh, in sell as a chicken meat so how can we trust and how can we so confident what we eat like uh, in Thailand, this is a f meat food product that you can uh, easy to find in the th in in a, in street of Thailand. But Muslim, we are minor uh, minor in the, in this country, so not of them we not so sure what we uh, we can eat or not. 
but uh, for the mus uh, Muslim, we are concerned uh, pork is a most contamination will be contamination in the food halal food product and they have not just only meat but it's also its derivatives just like uh, gelatin from the bone or skin of the pork and also uh, fat of them uh, in the lead oil as I mentioned before there are uh, scandal that not just only pork it have another species that will be contaminated in the halal food but we have to find the technique or methodology to detect the haram species in Thailand for halal accreditation we work harmonize with uh, harmonizing with the uh, uh, between Sharia and scientists why ulama they will provide or choose according to the Sharia while the scientists we will try to use a scientific analysis to close a gap understand between the ulama and interpreters and also Halal Science Center Chula Longkorn University we are support halal interpretation and certification process by using uh, analysis laboratory analysis and also impl uh, implement the how Q or hygiene insurance liability quality system for food industry manufacturers is a quality management system for halal food manufacturing to improve the consumer confidence in halal food products in Thailand for the halal certification uh, is solely author, uh, authorized by the Central Islamic Council of Thailand or Saikot and the halal, uh, halal under the concept of religion certifies halal science support the halal standard Institute of Thailand and halal science center Chula Lungkorn University will provide uh, academic and scientific to support uh, halal agriculture. So far, this is uh, the work of the Halal Science Center University, uh, Long, Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University. What we do, what we are doing right now in the laboratories, we try to develop from. Uh, this is, I will show the, uh, the technique method that we detect or analyze of uh, haram, inter haram adulteration to identify the origin species of the meat based on DNA like a real-time PCR droplet, droplet, digital droplet PCR and next generation sequencing. We are using real-time PCR to analyze the detection uh, of porcine DNA in the meat by using real-time PCR uh, right now uh, we are analyzing the product from the local and import for, uh, import product more than 50 thousand product that have analysis from the our our laboratories and as a DNA is a molecule that uh, encode genetic structure in the in the cell and it's the genetic information is carried on the linear sequence of DNA uh, moreover we are develop the multiplex real-time PCR using high resolution melting analysis to detect right now we can detect more than five species uh, we can we can identify the species by the difference of the melting point mel melting temperatures of the PCR products moreover we uh, we also stud uh, study to identify the haram species by using droplet PCR 
this technique is performed This technique uh, performed by fractionate uh, target DNA sample into 20,000 and the PCR amplifier of template molecule occur in each individual droplet. Our study trying to identify the uh, porcine DNA mixture with the chicken as you can see, this is a result of our study. It can de uh, detect the porcine DNA. And another, spe uh, another study uh, from the research. They, are, they can identify the chicken chip and goat in the uh, with the specific primers of each species the sequencing technology it can uh, determine the order of four best arginine guanine tysine in the strain of dna and the dna is a specific and unique of uh, for each species so the DNA sequencing is a high, tr high powerful tool in the filter to identify the harem species. Uh, uh, this is I will brief ab uh, briefly about the development of the DNA sequencing. It's a uh, this cover uh, from by the development of Frederick Center the first techniques are uh, the first technology of the sequencing it's called center sequencing and they are the technique also the further develop until now and the application application of the next generation sequencing it's more interesting and highly highly apply in the many field like uh, agriculture to get more information this technique can also uh, tra tra traceability of har haram species will be contamination in f halal food product GMO Until now, they have so many studies that apply of the next generation sequencing in many fields, just li uh, like a GMO or gen genetic modified organism to, ident to identify or identify the source of the of the of, of the food. And also, another study is uh, to identify the species of microbial in that's mixture uh, in the mixture tuna sample with the next generation sequencing also and also applying in the forensic side to get more data of by all bio, information you can see uh, next generation sequencing will be more in uh, more interesting for the market and by using uh, targeting sequencing and whole genome sequencing. In the Halal Science Center, Tulalongkorn University, we also study to identify the species of haram species that will be contaminated in the halal food. Right now, we are using the ion tolerant personal genome machine to as a next generation sequencing technique. The uh, for the next generation sequencing they have a general three step for the next for the sequencing first first is to preparing labor, uh, laboratory second tem uh, template preparation and uh, and the last step is a uh, sequencing i will show you a brief of uh, our study in uh, to identify the species, 
this is a preliminary study of of my works in the Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, by using uh, next generation sequencing. Uh, this technique, it will be uh, powerful to identify and tracing the haram species, because we not so sure what uh, in the halal food. It will be just only one species that will co contaminated or more than that. So, so this technique can be can be uh, can can have many uh, more informations of the adulterations. The study is uh, show that the next generation sequencing have different uh, different sensitivity for each, spe uh, each species so the uh, for the works i hope that next generation sequencing will be uh, powerful powerful tools for halal halal industry to develop and protect our muslim and non -Mus uh, non muslim also and I would like to acknowledge all the staff of Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University. Yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Sunaini. So um, we've not finished the session yet. So uh, we've come to an end in terms of the speeches for methodology in Halal Science and Accreditation. However, I would like to invite questions from uh, our esteemed audience here. So, um, if you have a question, please put, raise your hands and probably come to, to the microphone and shoot the questions to our uh, exciting speakers here. And, um, okay. Yeah. Any questions? No questions? Questions? Yeah? You have a question? All oh, right. Well, I actually have something to say. Um, uh, Foodinopolis have been um, in contact with uh, Tokyo SMEs, which actually um, um, executive of Tokyo SME come to us, and they, well, you are aware that um, in the 2020, um, in Japan, you have uh, an Olympic in, in, yeah. in, in Japan, right? So, um, Japanese uh, food manufacturing industry is quite concerned that how they would have the halal food available enough for um, during the events and all for the um, people that will come to, to Japan during that period of time. So they come to us and talk, ask us whether um, is it possible for Food Inopolis to connect them with the um, halal food manufacturers in Thailand? Because um, as um, you see that we have our um, excellent uh, infrastructures in terms of uh, and also um, certifications um, and accreditations body. So although um, halal food uh, manufacturing is um, very um, competitive uh, areas, but also there's um, opportunities for halal food producers and also opportunity for Thailand as well for halal food business. So actually I'd like to add a little bit on this and to see that um, uh, wh where we have the challenges for halal food uh, industry, we also have opportunities. And uh, this is also one of the things that Food Annapolis will be a kind of uh, bridging um, agencies. And uh, as I said in my presentation, we act as a platform. So we plug in everything. So right now we're actually talking with Tokyo SME what what uh, what kind of food and uh, trying to link them with the uh, halal food uh, producers as well. Cool. That that's really really good. I think this is really exciting and a great opportunity for uh, halal food companies to get into contact with food inopolis. I think it's really great how Thailand has uh, handled halal, uh, where where it's not a Muslim majority country. When um, Dr. Charan talked about difficulties in finding halal restaurants here. 
you must come to New Zealand. I don't know. They, they don't even have halal certification of the restaurants there. So I have to cook and work. <laughs> so uh, I think it's been great. Um, any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Assalamualaikum. My name is Ahmad. I have a question on Dr. Chon Yata. Dr. Chow. Dr. Question to Dr. Chow Yata. Dr. Chow Yata. Sorry. My, my question is, uh, Malaysia uh, have halal standards, and also Thailand also have a halal standard. So do the other country also have their own halal standard? So, what is different or can all these countries uh, possess or using the standard which can used by all these countries? You, you, you understand? All right, thank you. Yes, I hope that that will be the jobs of CMIX to help us all the world to have one standard. At the moment, you have one, you have your halal standard. Us in Thailand have halal standard. Indonesia, they have one. But actually, we should have one standard that come from, let's say, CMIX or something like this. And the same as the testing system, we have one standard from Metroji come from CMIX as well. I might put some something to CMIX here. Actually, the idea is to have a global standard for halal because in you know in the other room there are the there is a meeting of the certification bodies from around the world. They are also discussing this issue because in every country there are different halal standards and it is a technical barrier to trade. Actually, it's, it's, it's against the rules of the World Trade Organization. So we are promoting, we are encouraging them to use, to, to have this one unified standard. And as Mr. Karun Yafa explained, if we you know, establish the accreditation system and if we can provide them the same testing system, uh, for laboratories, for the proficiency testing, it will be m more applicable, inshallah. Yeah, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Who was it? All right. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, one more question. Uh, um, my name is Kesini Kedeka from Halal Science Center, Tulalongkorn University. Uh, I am one of the Food and Opolis team from the Halan Science Center, Tulalongkorn University. Uh, regarding the, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I am a staff from the Halan Science Center, Tulalongkorn University. Uh, regarding to the to that the Dr. Ek Anung uh, about the uh, uh, Olympic uh, the Olympic in Japan, right? Uh, I just want to inform you that. Uh, the Halan Sai Center, Tulalongkorn University, we work together with the Food Innopolis team of Tulalongkorn University. So, uh, we, we also talk about the, the Halan food, so uh, uh, how to integrate Halan food in the Food Innopolis platform of the Tulalongkorn University. So, about the, that you mentioned about the, the uh, Japan, uh, food manufacturer, Japanese food manufacturer. So, we, uh, I hope that uh, we can uh, have uh, more collaboration uh, between our Japanese foods and uh, in order to get the uh, halal for for support. Because uh, you know, uh, Japanese uh, for. Uh, certification body, uh, Japanese for certification body, uh, also uh, come to Thailand and 
a a a like a I just want to say that our, our Halan Science Center to La Lungkon UHC, we, we, uh, we work together with the uh, certification body, Japanese certification, Halan certification body as well. So it should be, it's, uh, we can talk, talk more about the, the, the Halan food uh, certification in the, in the Japan for uh, uh, Olympic. Was a comment, okay? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's been a great session, and I thank you all for your patience and your interest in this session. So we'll I, I'll declare this session close. But before that, please let us all give a round of applause to our uh, brilliant um, speakers today. And uh, that's it from me. Good afternoon. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson and all speaker. Now, may I invite Mr. Manas Subsantikun, Deputy Director, the Halan Science Center, Chorangkorn University, to give token of appreciation to our Honorable Chairperson and speaker. I would like to invite our speaker to in, in front of the stage. Uh, Professor Dr. Nasima Hamish. And next speaker, Dr. Eganong Chang Boa. Speaker as you can, Professor Dr. Nancy Dewi Juliana. <laughs> Next, Mr. Karki Kanku Taran. And next, Dr. Shalan Yafa. <laughs> and next, Ms. Sunaini Mahamad. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And I would like I would like to invite our speaker uh, to photo session in front of stage. Please welcome.
thank you everyone. So now I will have short coffee break for 10 minutes. Please be back here around 3.35.